Guten Abend. Let me begin by apologizing for the fact that those might be the only words in German that you hear from me this evening. I really have no excuse. I learned German twice, once at the University of Vienna and again at the University of Chicago, and I forgot it twice, which goes to show that klug by name does not necessarily mean klug by nature. I grew up in London. My parents spoke Yiddish at home, which should have given me a solid foundation for speaking German. But like many Jewish parents of their generation, they did so in order not to be understood by the children. And they succeeded. So thank you in advance for listening. Let me also express my thanks to my hosts for their invitation especially for inviting me to speak here and now, here in Berlin at the Jewish Museum, an institution that I admire immensely, and now on the eve of the 75th anniversary of Pogromnacht, which took place across Nazi Germany and Austria on the 9th of November, 1938. In Britain, we still say Kristallnacht, and I know and respect the reasons why this word has been retired in Germany, and in my lecture tonight, I shall use the name Pogromnacht. But I shall also allude to the connotations of the night of broken glass. In view of this anniversary, the question I am asking, what do we mean by anti-Semitism, might seem redundant, even absurd. If you want to know what anti-Semitism is, surely the answer can be given in one word, Pogromnacht. What more is there to say? Well, if there really were nothing more to say, I could sit down now and you could be spared the burden of having to hear me lecture in English for the next 50 minutes. But matters are not that simple. They are not that simple because anti-Semitism does not always come in the form of thugs and vandals smashing shops and synagogues and murdering people on the streets. It does not always wear its hate on its sleeve. And alas, it has not faded with the years. The title of this weekend's conference is Anti-Semitism in Europe Today, the Phenomena, the Conflicts. Europe Today is not incubating another Shoah, but no one with a sense of history can doubt that the well of anti-Semitism runs deep, and it has not run dry. It is still with us in the here and now. Europe today, what is it exactly? Some years ago, I took part in another conference in Berlin with a title similar to this one, Anti-Semitism Today, a European Comparison. It was organized by the Heinrich Böll Foundation and included panels of speakers from different countries, rather like this one. As one panel followed another, it soon became clear that Europe is not homogenous. It is not just one place. So, for example, a vital concern for the French panel was how to interpret a spate of attacks on Jews by young men of North African extraction. This was not exactly a burning issue for the panel from Poland. Europe has roughly 50 countries. In each country, there are different debates about anti-Semitism, different debates, but the same word. Which brings me to tonight's topic, what do we mean when we say anti-Semitism? Do we know what we mean? Does it matter? The word matters because the thing matters. It matters because unless we use the same word in the same way, we will be talking at cross purposes. It matters because we want to develop social policies that reduce hostility to minorities, and so we need to try to pick apart different kinds of hostility xenophobia, nationalism, anti-immigration sentiment, anti-Semitism, and other forms of racism. It matters because social statistics matter, and we cannot have valid or reliable data about anti-Semitic incidents or anti-Semitic attitudes if we do not know what anti-Semitic means. Finally, the word matters because it is heavy with history. 
echoing with the sound of shattering glass. As a result, it is not only a difficult word, but a dangerous one, for it is a word that can do harm if it is misused. Yes, it is a label that we need, a name for something that needs naming and denouncing, but a label can turn into a libel when it is pinned on the wrong lapel. Anti-Semitism has rightly been called a monster, but false accusations of anti-Semitism are monstrous too. For all these reasons and more, the word matters a great deal. What matters about the word, about any word, is its meaning. And as Wittgenstein points out over and again in his philosophical work, a word is not always the best guide to its own meaning. For a large class of cases, he says, and I'm quoting, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. Anti-Semitism falls into this class. It is a good example of how a word takes on a life of its own. Antisemitismus is a term that was coined in a particular place and epoch, Germany, in the second half of the 19th century, by people who were hostile to the Jewish presence in Europe. New terms are coined for a reason. The reason in this case was to mark a departure from the old hatred of Jews with its vulgar name, Judenhaus. The new term was a fancy word for a secular idea that supposedly reflected the state of science at the time, especially the so-called science of race. Racial ideas were fundamental for the Volkish nationalism that was on the rise and which led, of course, to Nazism. Thus, the term anti-Semitism was initially associated with a quite specific phenomenon, a biologically based conception of Jewish identity and a political movement rooted in a racial ideology. But despite some scholars who would like to keep the term in its box, the word has escaped into the world. Today, in its usual everyday employment, anti-Semitism, the word, covers a broad spectrum of attitudes and actions that target Jews, whether those actions and attitudes are based in biological racism or not. Moreover, the reach of the word now spans the centuries. We speak of anti-Semitism in antiquity and of anti-Semitism today. The meaning of a word is its use in the language, says Wittgenstein, and this is how this word has come to be used. It is too late for a committee of academics to veto its wider meaning or to substitute another term that they prefer, such as Judeophobia. The question is, what do we make of the word and do we take it seriously? No one would be here tonight in this room on the eve of the 75th anniversary of Pogromnacht if they did not take anti-Semitism seriously. Indeed, feelings tend to run high with this subject and perhaps they should. But sometimes Argument over anti-Semitism seems more like a barroom brawl than a civilized debate. We need light as well as heat. In this lecture, I am setting out to do just one thing. Turn up the light. Clarify the concept. This means that I shall not discuss such issues as the causes of anti-Semitism or the extent of anti-Semitism. I shall barely touch on the different forms that anti-Semitism takes, and only towards the end will I briefly broach the place of anti-Semitism in the larger picture of racism in Europe. <clears throat> All these topics are important, and I am sure they will be examined over the weekend by people here who are knowledgeable about the facts. I shall certainly refer to facts from time to time, but only in order to illustrate a point. And as a philosopher, the point I wish to illustrate will always be logical or conceptual rather than empirical, nor will it be political. Like anyone else, I have my political views, but my aim in this lecture is to step out of the political arena and to offer a framework of analysis. I hope this framework will be useful 
to other people who hear what I hear in the word anti-Semitism, echoes of shattering glass. The lecture is in three parts. Part one, a ride on a London bus. So what do we mean when we say anti-Semitism? To help us explore this question, I have brought along a cast of imaginary characters thrown together on an imaginary ride on a double-decker London bus, the number 73, whose route passes through the multicultural borough of Hackney. Apart from being where I live, Hackney includes the district of Stamford Hill, home of Europe's largest population of Haredi, strictly Orthodox, Jews. The cast of three imaginary characters include Lucy, the non-Jewish conductor, Rabbi Cohen, a devout passenger, and Mrs. Goldstein, a Jewish onlooker, also a passenger. We shall consider five scenarios in turn, in each of which Lucy, the conductor, evicts Rabbi Cohen from her bus, throws him out. With each scenario, we shall ponder the question, is she being anti-Semitic or not? Let us begin with a simple working definition. Anti-Semitism is hostility to Jews as Jews, or because they are Jews. Although, as we shall see, this definition is too simple, it is still, as Professor Tony Kushner has said, a useful tool. It has the virtue of excluding the case where Lucy angrily throws Rabbi Cohen off the bus for smoking, when smoking is forbidden by the rules. Even if Rabbi Cohen prays as he smokes, even if he is wearing a kippah, a skull cap, that identifies him as Jewish, even so his situation is no different from that of Jane Smith or Ahmed Khan or Bupinda Singh or any of the other passengers that Lucy evicts that morning from her bus for smoking. His crime is that he is a smoker, not that he is a Jew. This is the first scenario. It's a little more complicated if Lucy's hostility to Rabbi Cohen is based on the fact that he is singing Zemiros hymns on the upper deck at the top of his voice. But is it because he is singing Zemiris or is it because he is singing? Full stop, thereby creating a disturbance. Suppose he, Rabbi Cohen would have been singing, all you need is love. <laughs> would Lucy have still thrown him off the bus? In other words, what is he guilty of? Making a nuisance of himself or being Jewish? Let us give Lucy the benefit of the doubt. She's a liberal, tolerant, broad-minded woman, but she cannot let anyone disturb the peace of her bus. The fact that Rabbi Cohen is Jewish is neither here nor there for Lucy. But for Rabbi Cohen, of course, it matters. It's the reason why he is singing Zemiros. Rabbi Cohen is not merely a person who happens to be Jewish and happens to be singing. He is singing as a Jew. But she evicts him as a nuisance. This is the second scenario. Mrs. Goldstein, who is watching this scene from the back of the bus, smells anti-Semitism. She is wrong. But now let us not give Lucy the benefit of the doubt. Let us assume the opposite. She is an illiberal, intolerant, narrow-minded bigot. But about what or whom exactly? What does she know from Jewish? Rabbi Cohen is singing in Hebrew. Does she know it's Hebrew? It could be any foreign language. She looks at Rabbi Cohen with his strange appearance and his alien ways, and she sees a figure that she recognizes vaguely from the pages of the British tabloid press, the Sun or the Daily Mail. An asylum seeker or refugee coming here to take our jobs, live off our taxes, and threaten our British way of life. Seizing the moment, Lucy deports him from her bus. Now, we might call this a prejudice against immigrants, or maybe xenophobia, hatred of strangers, or difference, but it's not anti-Semitism. This is the third scenario. However, fourth scenario, perhaps Lucy's prejudice is more specific. She prides herself on not being an ignorant woman. 
One look at Rabbi Cohen's black clothes and long flowing beard and Lucy knows precisely what he is, a mullah. <laughs> Clear off, Abdul, she shouts in his ear as she shoves him onto the pavement. As Rabbi Cohen picks himself up and dusts himself down, he reflects philosophically that he is the victim of Islamophobia. But Mrs. Goldstein is convinced that all London bus conductors hate Jews. But now let's suppose that Mrs. Goldstein is right, not about London bus conductors in general, but about Lucy. Suppose she has seen through Lucy, and truth be told, the reason why Lucy ejects Rabbi Cohen from her bus is that she is, a, she is bigoted against Jews. This is the fifth scenario. She knows he is Jewish and she feels contempt or hatred for him because he is Jewish. What does this mean? Knowing he is Jewish, what exactly does Lucy think she knows? She is anti-Semitic. She despises him because he is a Jew. And what, pray, is a Jew? In his essay, The Freedom of Self-Definition, Imre Kotej, the Hungarian Jewish writer who survived more than one Nazi concentration camp, reflects on Jewish identity in the light of his wartime experience. I quote, in 1944, they put a yellow star on me, which in a symbolic sense is still there to this day. I have not been able to remove it. Uh, this was written in 2002, or published in 2002 in The Guardian. What he is unable to remove is the meaning of the word Jew that the Nazis invested in the badge, the yellow star. Cortez recalls Montesquieu's dictum, first I am a human being and then a Frenchman, and he comments, I quote again, the racist wants me to be first a Jew and then not to be a human being anymore. In a brilliant dialectical riff, Cortez works through the implications for the victim. I quote again, after a while, it's not ourselves we're thinking about, but somebody else, he says. That is to say, the self that we think about when we are under the thumb of the racist is not our own. In these circumstances, I am not my own person. In a racist environment, Kotesh concludes, I'm quoting, a Jew cannot be human, but he cannot be a Jew either, for Jew is an unambiguous designation only in the eyes of anti-Semites. Now, this is how I understand Kotesh. He is saying that the yellow star was not just a form of identification, picking him out as a Jew, but a whole identity projected onto him as a Jew. Pinning the star to his breast, they were pinning down the word Jew or Jewish, determining what it means. This meaning or identity, this unambiguous designation, as he calls it, belonged to the Nazis, not to the Jews, not to him. Kotej observes that, and I quote again, no one whose Jewish identity is based primarily, perhaps exclusively, on Auschwitz can really be called a Jew. What I think he means is that they cannot call themselves a Jew, they cannot define themselves as Jewish because the word has been snatched away from them, so they've got to take it back. It is someone else's brand stamped on them, and they are stuck with it, Jew. And this appears tragically to be how Kurtej views his own condition. Recall what he says about the yellow star that was pinned on him in 1944. I quote again, to this day I have not been able to remove it. It's as if he is unable to be Jewish on his own terms. But, to get back to the 73 bus, Rabbi Cohen, singing Zemiros at the top of his voice on the upper deck, is Jewish on his own terms. In Kurtesh's phrase, he can really be called a Jew. So Lucy knows Rabbi Cohen is Jewish. Rabbi Cohen knows Rabbi Cohen is Jewish. But do they know the same thing? They do not. For he is not the Jew, the lurid figment or fantasy that Lucy perceives and despises. So let us recap and take stock. We began with a working definition of anti-Semitism, hostility to Jews as Jews. In the light of the 73 bus, we need to amend this as follows. Hostility to Jews as Jews, in scare quotes. 
Adding the scare quotes around Jews might seem like a detail, but it transforms the sense of the definition totally. Spelling it out, it comes to this. Anti-Semitism is a form of hostility to Jews as Jews, where Jews are perceived as something other than what they are, or more succinctly, hostility to Jews as not Jews. We appear to have turned our working definition on its head. For even if some real Jews fit the stereotype, the Jew towards whom the anti-Semite feels hostile is not a real Jew at all. The figure of the Jew is a frozen image projected onto the screen of a living person. The fact that the image might on occasion fit the reality does not change its status. It remains an image. And I want to illustrate this point briefly. Consider the case of Peter Rackman, whose name in England is synonymous with slum landlord. I remember this when I was growing up. In the 1950s, Rackman ruled over a property empire based in the Notting Hill area of West London, charging his low-income tenants high rents that they could barely afford. Now, Rackman was Jewish. He was also, apparently, money-grubbing, unscrupulous, shady, exploitative, all of which are stock themes in the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew. Thus, he was also, you could say, Jewish. Anti-Semitism consists in collapsing this distinction so that to be Jewish is to be Jewish. The image, so to speak, fastens onto the reality. It uses the reality, in this case, the case of Rachman, to proclaim itself falsely as real. The rats are underneath the piles, the Jew is underneath the lot, is how T.S. Eliot puts it in two odious lines of poetry. But underneath the lot is not the real Jew, the flesh and blood Jew, it's Eliot's Jew, the figure of the Jew, a kind of cud chewed over and spat out by the poet. For Eliot, this distinction between real Jews and his Jews is a distinction without a difference. And there's the rub. Thinking that Jews are really Jews is a distinction without, uh, sorry, is precisely the core of anti Semitism. Anti-Semitism is best defined not by an attitude, but by a conception, an answer to the question, what is a Jew? Defining the word in terms of the attitude, hostility, rather than the object, Jew, puts the cart before the horse. Indeed, hostility is not the only cart that the horse can pull behind it. Envy and admiration are also possible attitudes towards the Jew which alerts us to the fact that philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism can be very close and can easily turn into each other. What do they have in common? They agree that I, say, a Jewish person, am larger than life. They share the assumption that I exist for them to play a role in their Weltanschauung and not for myself. They look at me and what do they see? Not an individual, but a token of a type, a representative of a group. They agree that I am not me. With Wilhelm Ma, the man who founded the Antisemitan Liga in Germany in 1879, we see how close philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism can come to each other. Ma wrote, and I quote him, I bow my head in admiration and amazement before this Semitic people. But he went on to say, quoting him again, which has us under heel. Similarly, he described Jews as, I quote, flexible, tenacious, intelligent. These are not in themselves terms of contempt. Their anti-Semitic bent is evident, however, when they are read in context. Here's the context. Quoting Wilhelm Marr again, we have among us a flexible, tenacious, intelligent, foreign tribe that knows how to bring abstract reality into play in many different ways, not individual Jews, but the Jewish spirit and Jewish consciousness have overpowered the world, end of quote. This Jewish spirit and Jewish consciousness is what Ma meant by Semitism. It is the main element in the word he helped popularize, anti-Semitism. It is the horse that pulls the cart. Who then are the Jews? 
that the anti-Semitic, sorry, that the anti-Semite hates or fears or despises or even envies or even admires? What is the unambiguous designation of the yellow star that Kurtej to this day is unable to remove? When they pinned that badge on him and he became a Jew, what did he become? Collecting some of the main themes that run through anti-Semitic discourse at the time, we can say this. He ceased to be a mere mortal and became, in a way, timeless. A cipher of the eternal Jew. An instance of the Jewish peril. I'm deliberately using terms here, of course, from anti-Semitic vocabulary at the, in that period. Here is a thumbnail sketch of this figure, the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew. The Jew belongs to a sinister people set apart from all others, not merely by its customs, but by a collective character. Arrogant, yet obsequious. Legalistic, yet corrupt. Flamboyant, yet secretive. Always looking to turn a profit, Jews are as ruthless as they are tricky, loyal only to their own. Wherever they go, they form a state within a state, preying upon the societies in whose midst they dwell. Their hidden hand controls the banks, the markets, and the media. And when revolutions occur or nations go to war, it's the Jews, cohesive, powerful, clever, and stubborn, who invariably pull the strings and reap the rewards. Now let me clarify the status of this thumbnail sketch that I've just um, read out and its use in defining anti-Semitism. The content is based on the anti-Semitic discourse of a particular period, roughly from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th. On the one hand, it is not intended as a definition. This thumbnail sketch is not intended as a definition because to be an anti-Semite, it is not necessary to tick every box, every one of those descriptors that I mentioned. And there are themes that I've omitted. Different themes are more prominent than others at different times or in the discourse of different groups or individuals who are anti-Semitic. And over time, they mutate. On the other hand, these themes are not peculiar to the modern period. Many of them recur in different epochs. Moreover, they are portable. They are detachable from any particular ideology. They can be applied to Jews, whether Jews are seen as a people, a nation, an ethnic group, a cultural group, a religious community, a class, a race, or whatever. Ma, Wilhelm Ma, saw Jews as a race. He saw them in biological terms. But his conception of the character of the Jew is detachable from his racial ideology. And he did not invent it. He inherited it. For in one variation or another, the themes in the sketch that I read out, or most of them, had been around a long time, long before anyone dreamt up the newfangled theory of race in the 19th century. The Semite of anti-Semitism is the Yudah of Judenhas in modern dress. It is this character that carries the weight of the word anti-Semitism. And although this character is not identical across time, there are, to borrow and adapt another idea from Wittgenstein, family resemblances between the figure of the Jew at one period and the figure at another. Overlapping traits that lead us with reason to employ the same word, anti-Semitism. So my thumbnail sketch of the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew is just that, a sketch. It is rough and ready, not precise and polished, more art than science. But it is useful, and it is more than useful. It is useful to have a sketch along these lines, however sketchy it might be, because without it, the word anti-Semitism is left floating in midair. The themes in the sketch give the word its ballast. You could say this, that the form of the concept of anti-Semitism, the form of the figure at its heart, is to be a Jew is to have traits A, B, C, etc. As though those traits constitute the being of a Jew, the essence of what it is to be Jewish. If this is the form, then the thumbnail sketch gives its content a content that is variable over time and from place to place, but which is consistent enough for us to think of the figure as singular, the Jew. 
To this extent or in this manner, it, it does the work of the word anti-Semitism. Without it, without some such sketch as the one I read out, the word is empty. But a word that is both empty and emotive is dangerous. Anti-Semitism is an emotive word. Thus, emptied of meaning, the word is worse than useless, which is why the thumbnail sketch is more than useful. This figure, more or less, is the character that Lucy, the conductor, sees in the fifth scenario when she ejects Rabbi Cohen from the 73 bus. She looks at him and she sees that character. It is what Kurtej became when, stripped of everything except the badge they pinned on him, he was made a Jew in Auschwitz. Anti-Semitism, in short, is the process of turning Jews into Jews. This is what emerges from our imaginary ride on a London bus. Part two, the voice in the room. Now at this point, I seem to hear a voice in the room. It's the voice of someone who has been waiting patiently for me to pause so that they can express their frustration with what I have been saying. And this is what I seem to hear, so I'm now going to paraphrase the voice in the room. It's all very well for you, meaning me, right, to make distinctions based on an imaginary ride on an imaginary bus. But this has little or nothing to do with the complexities of the real world, where things are usually muddled. You describe, okay, I describe, you describe five distinct scenarios as if it were possible to distinguish sharply between one kind of hostility to Rabbi Cohen and another. But the sources of hostility are often mixed. That's one objection. Moreover, you speak, of anti you speak as if anti-Semitism were always visible to the naked eye. But often it is disguised, hidden behind a mask like the mask of anti-Zionism. You give us a model, but a model is not reality. And reality is what ought to concern us. Your model might hold up in the safe haven of imagination, but in the rough and tumble of the real world, it is useless. Okay, that's my critic. Now, one reason why I have introduced this voice is that I suspect it speaks for a number of people here tonight. But it is not just a voice in the room. It is also an inner voice, a voice in my head, that expresses qualms I myself have had. However, I would not have got this far tonight, I would not even have begun, if I did not think I have an answer to this voice, so allow me to pick up the gauntlet that it's thrown down and reply. <clears throat> well, to begin with, the voice is right. It is reality, not a model, that should concern us. A model is just a tool and a tool is only as good as the work it can do. In general, it is not worth thinking about models unless they help us think about reality. But no model can match reality, and my bus model is no exception. For one thing, I could have outlined more than five scenarios. And for another, as the voice in the room says, things in the real world are usually muddled. But if there wasn't a model, we wouldn't need a model. The whole point of a model is to provide a structure, a structure that we bring to the chaos of experience. Whether the bus model is a good model is another question. It is certainly not good enough if it cannot cope with the two kinds of cases that the voice raises. So let us consider each of them in turn. First, the voice objects that, the real, that in the real world, things are not always as neat and tidy as they are on the 73 bus, with its five distinct possibilities. Again, the voice is right. The sources of hostility, in reality, are often mixed. But on a point of logic, if they are mixed, then in principle they are different. And if we want to understand the complexities of the real world, then we need to be able to separate them out. The model is a tool that helps us separate them out. One of the first pieces of research into anti-Semitism that I published in the late 1980s is a case in point. I examined the campaign in Britain against the Jewish and Muslim methods of slaughtering animals for food. 
The campaign was a mixed bag. Some of it was purely about concern for animals. Some of it was clearly anti-Semitic and racist. And some of it was a combination of these factors. I would not be surprised if the same is true today in Poland and other states where Jewish and Muslim methods of slaughter are once again being targeted. Similarly, with campaigns against male circumcision. But we must not jump to conclusions. In each case, the question needs investigating and to reiterate, the bus model is intended as a tool to help us recognize anti-Semitism when it is present and also not to condemn it when it is not present. Sometimes the mix of factors is messier. Even as I was writing this lecture, a fierce controversy broke out in Britain over a scurrilous article in one of the tabloids, the Daily Mail, under the spurious headline, The Man Who Hated Britain. The article attacked the late Ralph Miliband, Miliband, who was Jewish, came to Britain in 1940 as a refugee when the Nazis invaded Belgium and settled in London. Not only was he a prominent Marxist, but his son, Ed, is the current leader of the Labour Party. So there was a clear political motive for a right-wing newspaper like the Daily Mail to attack him. And yet, as the writer and journalist Jonathan Friedland put it, there was a whiff of something else. Three days later, that whiff turned into a nasty smell when, defending the original article, the paper published an editorial with the headline, An Evil Legacy and Why We Won't Apologize. Friedland drew attention to one passage in particular where, unexpectedly, the editorial brought in the Hebrew Scriptures. Here is the passage in full. I'm quoting now from the Daily Mail editorial defending their original article describing Ralph Miliband as the man who hated Britain. Here is the passage. Quote, We do not maintain, like the jealous God of Deuteronomy, that the iniquity of the fathers should be visited on the sons, but when a son with prime ministerial ambitions swallows his father's teachings, as the younger Miliband appears to have done, the case is different. End of quote. Now, two points here. First, the editorial quite gratuitously brings in the jealous God of Deuteronomy. This is one of the oldest anti-Semitic tropes, strangely enough, the vindictive, unforgiving God of the Old Testament. The logic of bigotry at work here is based on the principle, like attracts like. If the God of the Old Testament is vindictive, unforgiving, and so on, and if the Jews are drawn to this God and vice versa, it follows that the Jews themselves are vindictive, unforgiving, and so on. That's the logic of bigotry there. Second point is this. Note the emphasis on Ed Miliband's political ambition. Warning that he might, in the words of the editorial, crush the freedom of the press, the editorial closes with this remark. If he does, quote, he will have driven a hammer and sickle through the heart of the nation so many of us genuinely love. Us, note, as opposed to the Jewish subversive who inherits from his refugee father a hate-filled evil legacy and is liable to use his political power to stab the nation we love in the heart. Now, this is not to say that the Daily Mail was consciously pursuing an anti-Semitic agenda, but the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew haunts its editorial like a ghost that cannot be laid to rest. Let us turn now to the other kind of case, anti-Semitism in disguise. Now, in raising this issue, the voice in the room mentions the elephant in the room, anti-Zionism. I have no wish to dwell on this subject, but in Europe today, it is impossible to avoid altogether, and at least one panel tomorrow is devoted to it. The difficulty with this subject is that it is, that it is so politicized. In the public debate about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there is a familiar, depressing pattern in which opponents appear to be locked in an embrace from which they cannot escape. Critics of Israel crossing a line in the sand 
find themselves accused of anti-Semitism. They react by accusing their accusers, alleging that the charge against them is nothing more than the machinations of the Israel lobby. At once, this is seized upon as an anti-Semitic slur, which in turn is denounced as a Zionist smear. Round and round they go, down and down they go, in an acrimonious circle that gets ever more vicious. Now, the political argument is going to run and run. And all of us have a view about it, including me. These views divide us. But when we come together on a night like this, we must endeavor to put those differences, political differences, to one side. If we take the question of anti-Semitism seriously, as everyone here in this room does, then we must try to extricate it from the political arena. And here, I believe, the 73 bus comes to the rescue. The model can do more than cope with this case. In fact, it is in cases like this where bigotry is sometimes disguised as something else that the model proves most useful. This topic takes me back to my undergraduate days. It was 1968. I was 19 years old in my second year at University College London where I was studying philosophy. In those days, being a student meant being a full-time activist and only going to lectures when you could spare the time. <laughs> I was a conscientious student, and consequently, I didn't attend many lectures. But I did take part in a conference of the National Union of Students where, representing my own college union, I proposed a resolution condemning the so-called anti-Zionist purges carried out at the time by the government of Poland. This was 1968. The resolution, which was passed, by the way, said that these purges should be condemned for what they really were, anti-Semitism in disguise. So I know full well that anti-Semitism can be hidden behind the mask of anti-Zionism, as the voice in the room puts it. But think what, as a matter of logic, this means. If it can function as a mask, this implies that anti-Zionism as such is not anti-Semitic. A mask that is identical with what it masks is no mask. That would be like a wolf in wolf's clothing. And if it does function as a mask, then once we strip the mask away, the thing behind it is laid bare, as if the mask had never been there. In other words, anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism, whether disguised as anti-Zionism or as anything else or not. Then what is it? What do we mean when we say in a particular case that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic? Applying the model of the 73 bus, I suggest we mean this. The figure of the Jew is projected onto Israel because Israel is a Jewish state, or onto Zionism because Zionism is a Jewish movement. Now, sometimes this is obvious to the naked eye. Take, for example, the cartoon that appeared on the front page of the Italian newspaper La Stampa, on the 3rd of April, 2002. This was during the second Palestinian Intifada when the Israel Defense Forces were besieging the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. The cartoon depicted a baby Jesus in a creche. Seeing an Israeli tank, little Jesus asks, are they going to kill me for a second time? So milking the connotations of the town, Bethlehem, and the name of the church, Nativity, for all they are worth, the cartoon superimposed the mythic role of Christ killer onto the Israeli army because Israel, or its army, is Jewish. Here, the figure of the Jew lies on the surface of the text. But what if we think it is hidden behind a mask? Then we must look between the lines, and if we are right, we will uncover the same figure implicit in the text. Text or subtext, the figure is still the figure of the Jew. That is the point. And there are ways of bringing subtexts to light. Suppose there is a group that presents itself as pro-Palestinian, but like Mrs. Goldstein on the bus, we suspect that there is an anti-Semitic motive. We could look at the literature they produce, their history, their membership, their political connections, and so on then we are in a position to form a judgment, a judgment based on evidence. 
Now, there is no algorithm for doing this. The evidence might be insufficient. Moreover, we can be wrong, you know, we can come to the wrong conclusion. And there might be room for argument by people of goodwill who weigh the evidence differently, some believing that anti-Semitism does lie between the lines and others not. But what I'm describing would be a rational process of argument rather than the vicious circle of acrimony that I described earlier. The decisive issue would be this. Does the group in question project the figure of the Jew directly or indirectly, openly or otherwise, onto Israel? Do they, so to speak, pin a yellow star on the country, like the badge that was pinned to Kurtesh's breast? Do they, in short, turn the Jewish state into the Jewish state? And when Israel, I mean, I'm just improvising now, when Israel is spoken about as if it were all-powerful and had control over the fate of the entire region, you have an example there of the old anti-Semitic trope of the powerful Jew being projected onto the state, in my view. Now, masks come in all shapes and sizes, but the same logic and the same procedure applies to them all. In Europe today, especially on the far right, anti-Semitism, strangely, is at least as likely to lurk behind a mask that is pro-Zionist as anti-Zionist. Take the British National Party, BNP. Here is an observation made a few years ago by Ruth Smith, who was the anti-racism anti -racism coordinator for the Board of Deputies of British Jews. That's the body that represents the Jewish community in Britain. Um, she said, and I quote her, the BNP website is now one of the most Zionist on the web. It goes further than any of the mainstream parties in its support of Israel. Now that is not the end of her sentence, but let me pause to tell you that the BNP is an offshoot of the National Front and is widely regarded as neo-fascist. It is led by Nick Griffin. Griffin is notorious for his denial of the Holocaust in the past, and in the 1990s, he edited a BNP magazine called The Rune, whose anti-Semitic content led to his criminal conviction. So what has happened? The remainder of Smith's sentence explains it. The BNP website, she says, right, at the same time demonizes Islam and the Muslim, and the Muslim world, sorry. Jews, at least for the time being, in other words, are not in the gun sights of the BNP, whose viewfinder has swiveled and now seeks out Muslims. Support for Israel has become a stick with which to beat Muslims and to try to attract Jewish support. But it is a change of tune and not a change of mind or a change of heart. To quote Henry Grunwald, who at the time was president of the Board of Deputies, Quote, despite all its attempts to portray itself differently, we know it, the BNP, is still the same anti-Semitic racist party it always was. How do we know? By applying Wittgenstein's dic dictum, look and see. We know by looking behind the scenes, behind the mask, and taking stock of what we see. We know because of what we know about the BNP's past and the track record of its leader, Nick Griffin, we survey the evidence, and the evidence leaves no doubt. Behind the pro-Zionist mask, there lurks an anti-Semitic face. It is not always easy to know the truth about a group, but we can never know if we are not able to distinguish the hidden face from the mask that hides it. We need to know how to recognize that face and how to tell it apart from other faces. Faces with which it could easily be confused. And that was the point of the five scenarios on the 73 bus. True, the real world is more complex than a London bus. But the bus is a microcosm, a smaller, simpler version of the larger, confusing reality. The model is limited, and I am sure it could be improved. But despite its limitations, I hope it helps us get a little clearer about what we mean when we say anti-Semitism. That is its role, and this is my reply 
to the voice in the room. Earlier, I gave a number of reasons for saying that the word anti-Semitism matters. But words in general matter. This has been the underlying premise of my lecture. Perhaps I have a particularly keen sense of the weightiness of words because of my education. From the age of five to 18, I attended an Orthodox Jewish school in Northwest London. And you cannot study Tanakh or Talmud without learning to pay close attention to letters, let alone words. It's a curious fact about the Hebrew word dovar or davar, that it means both matter and word, as if the language itself were making the self-same point. Words matter. Not that you have to be Jewish to make or take this point. In the beginning, says John the Evangelist in the opening sentence of his gospel, was the word. Certainly, creation, according to Genesis, begins with words. God speaks, and heaven and earth come into existence. And since we human beings are, according to the biblical account, made but selam Elohim, in the image of God, it seems to follow that we need to watch what we say, for we too can form or deform a world, create or destroy it, a world or a person, with our words. All of which could also be said in a secular voice. Okay, I'm not standing here preaching. <laughs> Whatever the voice in which we say it, the point is the same. Words are more than mere signs or symbols. To adapt a remark that the English poet Byron made about passion, words are the element in which we live. That is why the question of what we mean by what we say is vital. It seems especially vital in this place and at this time with the word anti-Semitism. Part three, joining the dots. In my lecture this evening, I have been emphasizing the importance of making distinctions. Hence the five different scenarios on the 73 bus. In closing, I want to turn briefly to the other side of the coin the importance of making connections. I shall explain what I mean via a couple of recent examples in Britain. Well, actually, no. Anyway, yes, partly. Exactly two weeks ago, when I sat down to collect my thoughts for this concluding section, my eye was caught by a banner headline in the Guardian newspaper. Fear and distrust of Roma threatened to erupt into a European witch hunt. The article reviewed the moral panic that swept through parts of Europe when a so-called blonde angel, a little girl with fair skin and blue eyes, was taken by police from a couple in Greece. Because the couple were Roma or Gypsy, the automatic assumption was that they had abducted the child from white parents an assumption that appears to be false on both counts. They did not abduct the child, and the birth mother was herself Roma. Then something similar occurred in Ireland. The London newspaper Metro reported it in a story that filled their front page under the blazing headline, Anger as Girl Number Two Taken in Gypsy Raid. Metro, by the way, is a free newspaper given out all over the place in London. You pick it up on the tube, you pick it up in various places. So everyone was seeing this blazing headline, Anger as Girl Number Two Taken in Gypsy Raid. The seven-year-old child, described as having blonde hair and blue eyes, was taken into care. Subsequently, DNA tests showed that she was indeed her parents' daughter and she was returned to her family. Meanwhile, the words in the media do their destructive work, reinforcing the negative stereotype of the gypsy. The second example is the case of a 25-year-old graduate student, Pavlo Lapshin, who came to England in April from Ukraine. Within days, he tried to trigger a race war, stabbing Mohammed Salim, an 82-year-old Muslim grandfather, to death and exploding bombs near a number of mosques in the West Midlands with intent to maim and kill. At his trial last month in October, he pleaded guilty, 
saying that, and I quote him, he hated anyone who was not white. Now, with these two cases, it's not difficult to join the dots. It's difficult not to join them. True, the Roma or Gypsies were not targeted on pogromnacht. But the Nuremberg race laws of September 1935 were amended two months later to include them, and also black people, in the prohibition of marriage and sexual relations with those of German or related blood. Their link, the link of the Roma or Gypsies, to the fate of the Jews under the Nazis is captured dramatically in a telegram that Adolf Eichmann sent from Vienna to the Gestapo in 1939. Eichmann explained how, they would, how the Roma would be deported. How? By attaching, and I quote from the telegram, carloads of gypsies to each transport of deported Jews. Like Jews, the Roma were sent to Auschwitz and other concentration camps where most of them perished. As for Pavlo Lapshin, the other example I gave, his attacks were aimed at Muslims, not Jews. But his social media pages contained material relating to Hitler, as well as rabidly anti-Semitic material. There are numerous dots with different names. Racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, and so on. There is also the dot that consists in demonizing an individual for political purposes, distorting their work, misrepresenting their views, maligning their character, constructing them as someone they are not. I don't know what name to give this dot, but I'm quite sure it exists. Each of these dots is a dot in its own right, unique in its own way. And each word that names each dot matters in its own right, whether it's anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, whatever. But it also matters as part of a lexicon of bigotry. We need to single out each dot and bring it into focus on its own. But we also need to see the complete picture that emerges when the dots are joined. In other words, and this is my parting shot, anti-Semitism points beyond itself. It points to the myriad forms that bigotry can take. If when we say anti-Semitism, we do not join the dots, then do we really know what the word means? And are our ears sufficiently attuned to the echoes of shattering glass? Danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. <laughs>